Right? Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone here in person and at home. If you uh, would like to tell us where you are, just uh, out of curiosity, you know, these things online are just uh, make make us curious about where your location. So if you want to share that with us, I mean, it, uh, it can be interesting. That's all. Uh, feel free not to, but uh, obviously. And of course, I mean, if you want to let us know also about the weather that's maybe a bit better than here in England, <laughs> just probably like this is the case. But anyway, let us know something about you, your location and the weather. Um, just a bit of housekeeping um, first for the people here in person who may not be familiar with this building. Uh, so presentation will be presentations will be today and tomorrow here in C222. And refreshments and lunches for both days will be served in C224 uh, on the same floor you've been there. Um, so for those who uh, yes, for those who may or not in the middle of this building as well, um, services are down the corridor on the right. And uh, just in case. Just in case. The uh, emergency evacuation stairs are right outside this door on the left. Uh, so this uh, re opening remarks are really, really short, I promise. But the main thing, it is worth mentioning that this is a special year as it is the 10th anniversary of uh, the Center for Human Animal Studies. Mm -hmm. Therefore, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, the most Special thanks are for Claire Parkinson and Richard Twine, who's on his way to uh, to Edgehill. Unfortunately, there have been some uh, delays with the trains. <laughs> um, Claire and Richard, uh, 10 years ago, created this centre, which back then was the first of its kind in Europe. And without CFAS, this and last year, PGR Symposium, international conferences, seminar series with leading scholars, in critical animal studies and research projects would have never taken place. And moreover, uh, the centre has welcomed PhD students, postdoc researchers and visiting scholars. So thank you, Claire and Richard, for basically making all these things possible without who will be, will not be here probably, <laughs> all of us. Um, for this call for papers, we received so many brilliant proposals, which made the selection really, really difficult for us. But the interdisciplinarity of all the proposals that we received and the connections between the panels clearly showed the urgency of reflecting on the power of narratives and their circulation in a variety of fields, sectors and forms. But, so thanks to all the people who have expressed their interest in presenting and attending our symposium. Thanks to all the speakers who have adjusted, adjusted their schedules, tried their best for joining us, and to everyone who will be presenting and following the event from different time zones or very different time zones. We are so happy to welcome such an international cohort of speakers and we all know, even though it's always nicer to meet in person, we're also glad that keeping this hybrid formula has allowed us to be together for these two days of conversations about narratives and the known human. So we hope you'll enjoy this symposium. Thank you very much. Hey, people on the chat about where they're from in response to that initial question, Bianca. Yeah, sure. So we have, ooh, tell us more, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, we have someone from uh, Leicester, um, Germany, Netherlands. Um, yeah, I think that's everyone who responded in the chat. Amazing. Great. Thank you very much for joining. So, second, as I said, so, 
Okay, so our first our first speaker, uh, so sorry, welcome to panel one. Got confused, sorry. <laughs> welcome to panel one, literary and speaking animals. And our first speaker is Katya Krilova. Sorry if it's the wrong pronunciation, I <laughs> will do our best. Katya is a third year PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. She holds an MA in, con in contemporary art theory from Goldsmiths, University of London. And in her doctoral project, she addresses ethical issues related to pet influences, presence on social media, and the simulation of animal speech. But today, Katya is going to talk about a present paper titled, What Does the Magpie See Looking at Our Bruises? The Axman Carnival as a Literary Artifact for Advocate, uh, Advocacy for the Joint Center. Katya, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, without further um, introductions, um, I start with uh, explaining that the title of my presentation reflects the specific aspect I chose to focus on today, which is the experience of perceiving domestic abuse through the eyes of a non-human witness. Um, next, sli next slide, please. Uh, the plot of the novel unfolds around the magpie who fell out of his nest and was rescued by a woman living on a farm that specializes in sheep breeding. They bond and the magpie named Tamagotchi or Tamo for short develops an ability to imitate human language by picking up random phrases from humans, TV and radio and memorizing them. Gradually, the magpie learns to make connections between specific phrases and the context they represent. Uh, he cannot put words together to form new sentences, but he can learn, um, use learned phrases to express his attitude and uh, to convey a message. For example, when he witnesses abusive behavior and wishes to save his rescuer, he voices lines from crime TV shows like male Caucasian, mid 30s, armed and dangerous over. He also learns to understand the meaning of some of the human dialogues. Uh, this way he realizes that the abusive husband is the reason why his rescuer Marnie had a miscarriage. Uh, Tama's ability to memorize hundreds of phrases makes him a Twitter sensation and he saves the farm which has drowned in debt. At first, it seems that this sudden flow of money from influencer marketing will elevate the pressure, but in the end, Tamagotchi witnesses the worst outburst of violence and kills the abuser. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Okay, yeah. the, this story is full of controversial events and choices that can be analyzed from many different angles. But um, due to time limitations today, I'll discuss only several issues that specifically resonate with my research on the representation of companion animals. The first aspect that interests me is the figure of an animal influencer. For my PhD project, as was already said, I've been studying voiced cats, dogs and hedgehogs performing on Instagram. And in my opinion, Catherine Chigi gives a comprehensive and deeply situated account of how social media fame can affect animals. And first of all, what pressures some of them have to put up with offline to earn a living for their human families. The second aspect uh, is mutualism. In uh, digital media ecologies, Saitafil indicates that among four modes of symbiotic relationships, mutualism has often been neglected in the past compared to other types of interaction. Yes, mu yet mutualisms, uh, mutualists compose most of the world's biomass. The tradition of neglecting mutually beneficial symbiosis is a part of the context in which the evolution of human companion animal relationships takes place. In a way, this is similar to uh, what Peter Kropotkin has argued about uh, written histories neglecting the events of mutual aid and focusing on describing conflict. 
this is why I believe that we need more narratives of human animal re relationships framed as mutualisms. Even though companion animals are considered family members in many cultures, they are often framed as parasites. Uh, in the Companion Species Manifesto, Donna Haraway emphasizes the vulnerability of companion animals compared to working dogs and writes that the status of a pet puts a dog at special risk in societies like the one I live in, the risk of abandonment when human affection wanes, then people's convenience takes precedence and or the dog fails to deliver on the fantasy of unconditional love. Guardian dogs are respected for the work they do. Some are loved and some are not, but their value does not depend on economy of affection. In this regard, despite some obvious uh, shortcomings, many human animal influencers do an excellent job of reframing companion animals' relationships with humans from parasitism to mutualism. In Chiji's novel, the magpie is often addressed as a parasite by the abusive husband up to the point when Thomas' talents start to generate, gen generate money uh, through influencer marketing. However, uh, Thomas' relationships with Marnie are different, and this is the third aspect which interests me, and I suggested to call it advocative mutualism. In the X-Men's Carnival, a woman and a magpie advocate for each other. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Varney affirms Thomas' right to life uh, in a place where magpies are considered pests and killed uh, to, protect, pr to protect cherry orchards. At the same time, Tama effectively draws attention to Marnie's right to protection from all forms of violence, not limited to physical abuse, but also emotional, such as constant remarks from her mother objectifying and criticizing Marnie's body. Mutualism also manifests in how Gigi maintains the balance between representing human and non-human struggles. She does not simply instrumentalize the magpie to talk about human distressing experiences, but engages in an imaginative understanding of how it may feel to be a bird separated from his species by accident and then rejected for developing affection for radically other. And this radically other, from the perspective of a flock, human being, uh, which is human being, is seen as a despised other, someone who brings death to magpies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, precisely because the story is narrated by a non-human animal, his words create two interesting effects. For Thomas' eyes, domestic abuse appears as something extraordinary, and at the same time, as an intersectional problem. Regarding the first aspect, Thomas' reflections articulated in peculiar English depict domestic abuse experienced by his guardian Marnie from a new angle. On the other hand, human witness and narrator defamiliarizes domestic violence and its effects to the extent that they appear as something unexplainable, something yet to be understood. Regarding the second aspect, Seen through Thomas' eyes, Marnie's husband's abusive behavior gains the complexity of an intersectional issue shaped by various prejudices that overlap with the challenges posed by late capitalism in rural areas. There is an, also an issue of climate change because the story is situated in the driest region of New Zealand, central Otago, where farmers try to survive under the pressure of investing in irrigation systems because they can no longer rely on rain. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Thomas' perspective on abuse works as an estrangement technique, uh, first described by Viktor Shklovsky, who wrote that art exists that only uh, that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. And this is precisely what the magpie does, trying to describe and make sense of things he witnesses in the human house. And here I want to give an example, which is beautiful and frightening at, at the same time. At first, Tama talks about his feathers, 
I flew, uh, I flew for food, spying mice and lizards from the air, but I flew for the joy of it too, for the feel of every feather stroke, stroked flat. And I saw that black is not just black, but green black, purple black, blue black. But a couple of pages further, he enters the bedroom and sees um, bruises on Marnie's body for the first time. She opened the dress and there it was on Marnie's trunk, on her soft white stomach, green black, purple black, blue black, black black, the size of a fist. Next slide, please. Being a part of a human household, Tama witnesses various patterns of oppression, including sexism, speciesism, and racism. From his observations, we can see how patriarchy, capitalism, and colonial optics still affect everyday lives in rural New Zealand. Narrated by Tama, Chiji's description of a cultural patterns of oppression intertwined and reinforced by the crisis work as a coherent testimony. None of the arguments seem far-fetched. For example, by describing what Tama hears on the radio, she exposes ethnic discrimination as something which is still a part, part of quotidian life. Uh, I quote, she turned on the radio on the kitchen table so I would have some company. And the radio said, here is one from the Beach Boys to get your toes tapping. And it said, get down to the Cameron's flooring to for 10% off, terms and conditions apply. And it said, the Maoris want it both ways. They want the land back, but they want to keep the electricity and the flushing toilets and all the things we brought with us. Next slide, please. The process of Tama becoming an influencer highlights another intersectional problem, the production of different personalities, a social media persona appearing in front of a camera and a private one, and both barely intersect. In Tama's words, uh, to begin with, there was two different Robs. Old Rob still watched me like he was planning something. Uh, like he wanted to drive me up to the killing house where he drove the dog Tucker sheep or load me on the truck that came to take the lamps to the works. Old Rob still bashed the wall of the master bathroom when I talked at night. He still checked the level of grain in the grain silo and said there was not enough. He still headed to the pines with his rifle, pulling on his balaclava, covering his face like a perp. And despite hearing alarm calls, I still believe that Marnie to what Marnie told me, that he was shooting rabbits, which were pests. Uh, to add some context, magpies memorize human faces so survivors can attack the aggressor. That's why Rob covers his face. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and there is another Rob in the living room and in the kitchen and on the back porch. Uh, when the eyes were watching, new Rob appeared. He made sure I had my favorite clothes, packs to play with on the couch. And, the, and he brought me little bits of bacon and dried apricot. He helped with my costumes. He agreed with everything I said. Sure, Tama, whatever you say, Tama. The followers ate it up, cobbled it down. What a gorgeous family, they said. Tama, you are lucky to have such a caring mom and dad. Man, take note. This is how you treat the ones you love. This is a real man. The pressure of an act an abuser had to perform in front of followers piles up and contributes to the final violent episode when the whole feed sees Rob beating his wife because now Tama can interpret the signs of what is coming and turns on the camera in the room. Um, I hope uh, these examples give a rough idea of how creative writing can become an effective strategy for confronting oppression from the perspective of intersectionality. The non-human narrator here is essential because uh, his voice is strange and his interpretations of human actions at times are quite far from what is happening. This constantly creates the sense of incongruity and this quality highlights things that have been rendered mundane. Um, in conclusion, I want to emphasize again that how the magpie's voice is constructed here reveals the author's genuine interest in non-human ways of living. For example, the fact that magpies 
uh, like to collect things manifests not only in Talman stealing robes, lighters and pills and storing them under the bathtub. He collects and sorts human words and actions in the same way. As this quote demonstrates, he creates lists and describes people through them, almost like he strings beads on a thread. Um, thank you. I hope um, I haven't exceeded my limit. <laughs> Thank no, you no, so much for good. listening. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Now, with me, yeah, it's really great to be here. So, yeah, I'm Sam. I'm um, from York St. John's. I've traveled quite a bit um, to be here, which has been really good. So, today I'm going to sort of talk to you about um, something that I've been kind of looking at in my research, which is um, kind of different ways of categorizing non human narratives. So, um, there's two categories I've been working on at the moment, which is our term and the percentage transformations. I transform doing hands and I'll kind of unpick what I mean by that um, in a little bit. Um, um, but first, I'm sort of I'm going to look at kind of how these categories either break down or reinforce the kind of human animal binary. So my research in general is looking at kind of non-human narratives, the effects they can have on humans and that kind of there's a natural kind of end in newer fiction that that starts to engage with things like climate change because that's the most particular I will read about today. So um, I'm going to start off by kind of exploring dualism. Um, it's a kind of theory that's generally separate the world into those that have language and those that don't. Um, I'm going to then explore, because I'm a literature student, I'm going to um, do some close readings of the metamorphosis and annihilation um, as um, pieces of uh, literature that I think really well showcase um, the kind of different aspects that um, I've used to define um, anthropocentric transformations and transformative encounter. First, dualism. So, um, Cartesian dualism is a philosophy that generally separates in the, in the world into those that have conscious minds and those that don't. And language is one of the main dividing factors. So, language has been positioned as a way of being in the world. It's an ontology which sets humans apart from other animals. And if indeed language acts as the basis for a mind, and those creatures incapable of entering to its sphere and of making sense of the world via words and syntax are mindless. So I think this kind of philosophy, it draws a very clear line in the sand and barry between all those that have language, which is usually just humans, and all those that don't have language, which is animals, plants, um, other kind of aspects of the world and the environment. And these are usually kind of start to be treated as passive, mindless, passive objects. Um, and it's probably safe to say that most people don't necessarily prescribe to dualism in their day to day lives. You know, I think anyone that has a, as an animal, uh, as a companion species, as a pet, or has spent a lot of time around animals knows that there's some consciousness going on that there's, they, they are active agents. They're not just sort of passively reacting to, uh, to what we do. But I think it is a philosophy that really underpins a lot of our very negative uh, ways that we interact with the world. So if you think of things like factory farming, um, deforestation, um, the fact that we're not doing anything about climate change, dualism is kind of, I think, still at the heart of those kind of decisions, unfortunately. Uh, which brings me on to anthropocentric transformations, uh, which is quite hard to say um, the amount of time I've had to say in practice <laughs> this, uh, this, this presentation. So um, this focuses on um, narratives where a human is transformed or has been transformed into an animal. And so their body is physically changed. You think of um, one of probably a good example is the kind of obvious metamorphosis and the kind of myths in that. Um, they have a very fixed narrative perspective and what I mean by that is although the body might change, the mind does not. So the mind in the narrative, in these narratives um, that I have kind of defined as these, remain very human and the transformed undergoes a loss of voice, which means very, very keenly they are unable to communicate their internal humanity. So they start to become viewed and judged as an animal. Um, and this often can be used to highlight the ways animals are treated because someone with a human mind is now having to navigate the world as an animal and mistreated as such. Um, now, I think these narratives tend to reinforce rather than break down the barrier between humans and non-humans because the human self is maintained against this kind of animal body, which kind of becomes this other, and the, often the human mind fights against it, so it's trying to get away from it. It's, it's presented as something that's quite negative and the consequences of that on the human um, are, usually, are usually bad. Um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have transformative encounters, which I think are best defined um, by their results. Um, 
if it's an encounter with something, it could be an animal, it could be a human, it could be a non-human, it could be an environment, but it's an encounter that changes the mind of the person undergoing this encounter and this transformation, and very importantly, it changes their position in the world. But it's something that I think relies on that person being open to the encounter, but it's kind of like, how, how are we open? So um, to draw on a couple of theories, so Donna Haraway speaks about encountering animals with curiosity, and she talks about entering generative disruption. And another theory is Anna Singing explores unpredictable encounters. She says that precarity is the condition of being vulnerable to others. Unpredictable encounters transform us. We are not in control even of ourselves, and we're unable to rely on stable structure of community. We are thrown into shifting assemblages, which will make us as well as others. So I think through meeting these encounters, whatever they are, with an attitude of vulnerability and curiosity, we're able to break down our idea of self, our idea of human, and be open to it. Uh, but we have to want to cross this barrier. We have to want to kind of encounter this encounter. And I think it's a lot of narratives where people reject this kind of invitation, and that reinforces our sense of humanity. So these are encounters that change the mind instead of the body. Um, so back to a anthropocentric transformation, and the one I've to look at today is the metamorphosis by Kafka. So um, for anyone that's not very familiar with this narrative, it's about Gregor Sansa who awakens one morning to just find out he's been transformed into a giant insect or a giant vermin. Um, and the narrative basically deals with his his family's reaction to it. Um, now, I, I've passed this as an anthropocentric transformation because his monologue remains directly in the human. One of the, th the first things he worries about is work. And he says, even if he did not catch the train, he would not avoid his, his boss's anger. So to put it into the context, he's just woken up as a giant insect. And he still kind of sees himself as human and is worried that he's going to be late for work. And he can still in some way go to work and, and do his job. Um, and now Haral, um, Namar Haral observes that Gregor, his human thoughts are sharply contrasted with his animal body. And it's a juxtaposition that underlines the chasm between his mind and his body. So his mind and body begin to split. His mind views himself as human. His body is very clearly not human. Looks like something like that. Um, and he's unable to communicate his um, humanity with his family when he kind of talks to them. His voice is described as the voice of an animal. So the loss of voice, it creates a barrier between his human consciousness, which is trapped within this animal body and um, his, his ability to communicate that with the outside world. And he begins to be viewed purely by his appearance, um, by his family as an animal. And his family begin to loathe and fear him, fear him. And it leads to his sister saying, we've got to get rid of the idea that that's Gregor. Um, he's no longer seen as Gregor and his humanity has been subsumed into this animal other. Um, and this change in his status from someone into something, and um, Haral observes, some, um, having heard his sister expressing his wish to disappear from their lives, Gregor expires. Had his family not excluded him, presumably Gregor might have been less wretched, perhaps even content. And so the kind of moral rights um, that we reserve for humans have been um, retracted from him, and he's sort of treated as an animal and, and kind of dies as an animal. And I think although this narrative doesn't necessarily break down the human animal barrier, I think it reinforces it, it does start to suggest that perhaps animal is a constructed societal state. It's not a biological state, it's something that we put onto certain animals and kind of treat them in certain ways. And that is kind of what happens to Gregor, his family constructed state as an animal. And this um, reinforces the human animal barrier as he's defined, defined purely by his appearance. Um, so in contrast, annihilation, which I um, would put into the category of a transformative encounter. Um, so for anyone who's not read the book or watched the film, um, it's a very different narrative. It's a really good narrative. It is by Jeff Vandermeer and it kind of tells the story of Area Rex, which is a kind of undefined anomaly uh, that's happened to a, a, a large area of, of land and it's become this kind of pristine wilderness that's surrounded by a barrier of various government agencies are trying to monitor it, sending expeditions in to try and collect data and it kind of resists this um, sometimes in very violent ways so either people come back for a change or they don't come back at all and they recover um, artifacts from there that kind of suggest that the people have kind of in some way died with an area wreck. So Annihilation is about the 12th expedition and it kind of focuses on the character of the biologist um who within her kind of going into area she um has a numerous kind of transformative encounters with the environment that kind of break down her sense of self um the first one is when she um encounters this subterranean structure which she describes as the tower and she has this kind of dialogue between her 
and one of the other members when she encounters these words um, kind of on the on the side of the tower that have been made out of living fungi. So she says words made of fungi. There is no recorded human language that uses this method of writing, the anthropologist said. Is there any animal that communicates in this way? No, there is no animal that communicates in this way. So the environment or something non-human within the environment, because this is a pristine environment that has there's no humans living in it, possesses language. And the kind of implications of this on aren't really far lost on the biologists. And she also describes it them as being impossible or insane or both, that she would prefer the words that have been written in an unknown language. This would have presented less of a mystery for us to solve in a way. So something about the fact that it's possessing human language, we think back to dualism, language is the thing that we generally used to separate us from the environment. And now an environment or something within this environment that's not humans possessing the language begins to break down um, this barrier that's kind of been constructed in dualism. And it starts to break down um, the biologist's um, separation between her and the environment. She's also physically contaminated by this encounter. So the um, fungi that's that's kind of arranged in these uh, in these words and this kind of sermons going down this tower, um, it releases some spores that she breathes in. And in this encounter, she embraces um, her vulnerability. So if we think back to um, the Anna Singh and that kind of importance of kind of being vulnerable um, and you know um, acknowledging her vulnerability, and she says. I had noticed no physical changes, and on some level it didn't matter. I knew I was unlikely to have any antidote to something so unknown waiting back at the camp. So she doesn't reject this contamination, she doesn't try to fight it, she kind of accepts it, she accepts that she can't do anything about it, she's breathing these balls, and whatever happens is going to happen. And she also begins to become curious um about um the words and she she kind of describes herself as being drawn to them and expresses a want to continue to reading the words and that the rest of the party would have to physically restrain her from reading this um and this leads to a gradual change in her throughout the narrative which is referred to as the brightness um and as i sing observes contamination through encounters changes the south and it makes way for others in collaborative world making projects and annihilation the biologist accepts and embraces her changes and a new place in the world um, she encounters the writing in sports with curiosity. She's drawn back to them and she acknowledges her inability to control what's happening to her and embraces her transformation. And this leads to kind of um, quite late on in the narrative, she um, begins to not even view herself as separate from the landscape. And she says, the brightness is not done with me. It's just beginning. And the thought of continually doing harm to myself to remain human seems somehow pathetic. Will I melt into the landscape or look up from a stand of reeds or the waters of the canal to see some other explorers staring down in this building. So I think that Annihilation really embodies the concept of a transformative encounter. It demonstrates the effect this transformation can have on the idea of the human self. It breaks down the barrier between humanity and the world and the barrier between the human and non-human animal. And the biologist is, en is able to enter into a collaborative world building with area X and kind of in a way becoming part of it. And I think within both these language, um, narratives, so within annihilation, within metamorphosis, language is a key. Um, Gregor's loss of voice means he is able and able to communicate his humanity, and the language present within area X means the biologist is unable to hold on to a sense of separation from it, and it breaks down um, the dualism of self and other. So I think fiction um, is a really important place to kind of explore these speculative ideas and it can challenge our assumption of representing narratives that explore new ways of viewing and being in the world. Um, in this talk, I've looked, we've looked at sort of Cartesian dualism and how this generally separates the world into those with language and those without language. We've looked at anthropocentric transformations and transformative encounters, and we've kind of explored these through close readings of annihilation and the metamorphosis. And the metamorphosis language separates Gregor's unchanged mind from his changed body and sort of presents um, the idea of animal as a societal rather than a biological state. And annihilation um, language with an area X implies personhood and conscious mind. It breaks down the biologist's sense of self and the separation from the environment. And in conclusion, non-human narratives can challenge preconceived notions about our place within the world through narratives which challenge the linguistic lines with which the world has historically been divided. Thank you. We are almost perfect on the video schedule, so thank you. Um, I'll open the ground to questions, both from um, from home, let's say, <laughs> and here in person. Yes, Elena. Thank you. I'm all for uh, 
fantastic presentations. I enjoyed uh, all of them. Um, so my first question is uh, for our last speaker. Um, uh, excellent presentation. I was just thinking about the. Um, do you think that there was some sort of influence of these kind of ancient Greek classical texts on much later pieces of literature? So initially, things that sprung to mind was uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and the scene in uh, the magician's nephew, the first text, which not everyone has read. Most people start with the line of the wardrobe, where Aslan gives the animals the ability to speak. So that was one of the things that I thought had this kind of uh, concepts um, that were present in the way that he wishes to remain a pig, maybe influence that. And then on the other side, I was thinking of the film Spirited Away by Studio Ghibli and how at the beginning of that movie, uh, spoiler alert if anyone hasn't watched it, um, the her parents are turned into pigs and she has to overcome all of these challenges in order to uh, make them turn back, revert to their human selves. And watching that as a child, I was quite terrified of it because it was trying to play on the big thing of people being greedy and how they ate the food that was in the spirit dimension. And that's what turns them into pigs initially. And that fear of like, oh, that could happen to me if I like my food. And, you know, this kind of sense of that being horrific, whereas this providing a contrast and suggesting that actually having an existence as a pig is better than being human. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about perhaps how this Obviously, a much further text has kind of influenced those later pieces of uh, film and literature. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of the spirited away, but now that you mention it, yeah, it's <laughs> it's similar. So I, I mean, this this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not sure, but I would probably think that this Greek tradition, this ancient tradition, has influenced. Mm, literature for you know the later centuries most certainly because speaking animals apart from this little work by Plutarch are also present in the fables by Aesop which is very well known a very influential in universal literature so I think this um, theme of the talking animals sort of reveals uh, an anxiety about animal subjectivity that has been there since the beginning. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's uh, like a direct influence of Greek literature or if this anxiety has also happened spontaneously in other cultures, in other historical moments. But for sure, the, the this connection is really interesting to to think about. So yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. I uh, see a paper collaboration over there, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so are there any other questions? Uh, from Beth? <laughs> Sorry, it's me. Um, yeah. I wanted to say, Sam, thank you so much. Your presentation was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, so I was sort of thinking a little bit about, again, with a media influence of Pinocchio and the scene where the boys are kind of construed as being kind of behaving immorally and as a result are turned into donkeys and how Pinocchio kind of goes through a transition of be almost becoming a hybrid in that he doesn't completely uh, end up as a donkey where some of the other boys do. Uh, so I was just kind of wondering um, how this this tech that I'd never heard of before, the uh, was it Annihilation? Um, this sort of second one that you mentioned is trying to kind of suggest that being hybrid, being uh, sort of joined with nature is not something to be feared, but something to be embraced. And that also kind of, sorry to ramble, but I uh, also am really interested in like, disability studies. Um, and it reminded me of when I was doing my master's, I looked at conjuring twins and how they're sort of two bodies in one and how that was something that in that period was very difficult to disentangle. And also, again, on the strand of disability, uh, individuals who are mute, either because they were deaf or were never educated, or those who actually are incapable of speech, how in sort of Descartes' view, how are they constructed? How are they still seen as being human and belonging to that identity? Uh, so I just wondered if you could sort of have your thoughts on that. Yeah. So this so this start. So I think in a lot of the kind of more traditional stuff that I've looked at, like punishment, uh, being turned into an animal is is usually kind of a punishment. So in a lot of Ovid, uh, one of the other myths I've kind of looked at um, is the Actium myth, where he's kind of punished, kind of transgressing um, the kind of natural law. So I think like yeah, in in a lot of older things, it kind of being turned into an animal or some kind of 
hybrid state is kind of seen as a punishment and then in in some more um kind of recent um fiction like kind of annihilation it's kind of starts to begin become suggested that actually potentially it's not a bad thing there's an interesting kind of term and theory around like human animal which is kind of like a kind of hybrid sort of form and interestingly so there's a really interesting book of poetry called human animal which kind of it is really really good um and i recommend reading it but it sort of talks a lot about kind of othering so the um animal othering kind of othering by a race and othering kind of via disability as well and kind of um talks kind of about constructed identities that kind of move past the kind of um it's like the kind of sort of protrudian man sort of sense of kind of um, anthropocentrism where you've kind of got the, the human is being kind of like the the top and the the norm but it's as a, as a human it's a very much a kind of it's, it's it's a straight human it's a white human it's a it's usually a male human and it starts to kind of open that space up to um identities that don't fit within within that form does that kind of um, <laughs> answer some of that yeah no definitely uh, i mean i think when it comes to that question about mutism i think that was something that renaissance and early modern thinkers really struggled with because you know they then tried to uh, presume that people that were deaf were uh, an intelligent so they'd say deaf and dumb and things like that but then they'd actually decipher that they could understand and they could write and they could communicate Definitely, in various yeah. forms uh so then that kind of medical model sort of evolved uh, after that but they still struggled with that kind of how do we separate people who are mute uh, from animals and um yeah so i suppose it's a, a thing of we language is not necessarily spoken in languages also in yeah, areas there's a there's an interesting uh kind of uh so like obviously like semiotics is kind of the study of like signs and symbols and kind of communication methods and it's an interesting just kind of like very niche school of semiotics called zoo semiotics that kind of opens it up to a lot of non-human uh kind of communication so signs that animals might even in the environment or the ways that they kind of react and interact to different um, interferences in the environment and it tries to kind of this decipher those so that it kind of not doesn't give human language to non-humans but it opens up what we consider language um, so it's not kind of putting because we, we kind of have this thing where we, we tend to like um only identifying kind of communication methods as being our language or like things like like crows and ravens that can mimic this it's, it's still only seen as mimicry it's not kind of seen as syntax so they're not kind of putting those sentences together but there's a lot of theory that is kind of like tries to open that up so we're not trying to only see put our language onto non-humans it's kind of opening up um what we view as communication and language to their methods of communicating so it's kind of a little bit more open and a bit less anthropocentric thank you so Sorry. much thank you and to link to, link back to your uh, previous question and now uh, for sure i mean there's a connection between uh ancient greek literature and pinocchio definitely because the transformation into donkey that takes place in also after Vegas metamorphosis. <laughs> Just to say. <laughs> I love the connections there between uh, the visuals. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I said that was a hand up by uh, Daniela, but maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Let us know. Hi. Um, I, I have a question, but it's more about um, something that Lisa said that I found really interesting about speculative anthropomorphizing. And I was basically wondering if you have written anything about that or is there any way, to, like, is that your concept? Is there any way to quote you on that? Because I found it very generative for my work and would want to quote you appropriately. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, well, I'm still writing my PhD, so I haven't <laughs> published anything, but of course I am drawing on a long tradition of um, scholars rethinking anthropomorphism. So a really great um, book that really influenced my thinking here is um, Daston uh, and Mitman's, um, what's it called? New takes on anthropomorphism or something. I can write it in the chat where they kind of show that thinking with animals um, has always been um, part of how we interact with animals and that um, this kind of this a kind of new idea that um, we do that anthropomorphism is something to be avoided basically and also um, Franz de Waal I guess you know the primatologist Franz de Waal he also showed in ethology nowadays um, anthropomorphism is often used as a heuristic method to kind of um, speculate upon uh, the inner lives of animals um, so taking these ideas of uh, cross-piece kinship as a basis to kind of think further and um, 
yeah that's thank you very much what i could think of right now yeah. this is really useful thank you hey thank you are there any questions yes cameron um yeah i mean i'm saying it's less of a question and more something i just found interesting i just wondered whether it's for catch so um whether you could just talk a bit more about um which is about when you talk which also connects to my research when you talked about how rob sort of did this kind of performative kind of masculinity role where and the kind of praise he got from others for doing that and how that was sort of seen as a model and that really kind of it's really that kind of private public kind of dualism going on and um, you know where the private behavior and the public kind of display was so different um and yeah i just wonder where we talk a bit more about that and how that kind of plays out in in the book oh yeah hi um this uh, actually uh, goes throughout the whole book and through his eyes we can see uh, how actually different factors um, um, have an impact on the transformation of the the figure of the abuser and uh, what is what was striking for me is that um, almost or almost until the end all the all the other all the other characters they kind of try to um, explain his behavior uh, to uh, to uh, cut him some slack, as they call it. So uh, when uh, when it comes uh, to um, Tama becoming influencer uh, and we see how the new personality is appearing, we um, um, there, there are several chapters where uh, the magpie tries to make sense of what what is happening, and he uh, at first he doesn't believe that he cha he has changed, and he collects the clues that that can help him to make sense of uh, two new people appearing in the same house, looking the same but acting differently, uh, depending on where the camera uh, is situated and is it on or off and. But at the, at the end, uh, he manages to trick the magpie and he even starts to believe that this man has changed, that the money has changed, uh, has changed him. And he tries his best to earn more money, to communicate with followers, to even interact with them offline, but it doesn't help in the end. Okay. Uh... Well, thank you very much for the brilliant questions, but especially for our brilliant speakers. Let's give them a round of applause. For those of you who want to uh, 